So uh, let's go to the WL architecture and peripherals. I will show you only the Delta approach. So, so the new peripherals, the new configurations, the new features. So the, the key learning of that part is the WL architecture the new peripherals and uh, low power modes and low power features. WL embeds dual CPU. So we have Cortex-M4 called Cortex-M0+. And uh, it's important to remember that uh, Cortex-M4 is more application MCU and the associated number is, is one. So the CPU one means Cortex-M4 and Cortex-M0 plus it is CPU two. And CPU two is more related to the security area. What is important, we have three independent systems uh, inside the WL. Cortex-M4, M0 and Entradio can operate in independent way. This is the, the architecture of the dual core. So we have three systems, CPU1, CPU2 and radio subsystem. There is common domain uh, which is relevant to uh, all the cores and in common domain we have flash, SRAM 1 and 2, uh, reset and clock controller, power peripheral and uh, external interrupts peripheral. And if NF core is, is working, uh, I mean uh, M4 or M0, uh, those peripherals are always clocked. And there are another peripherals in common domain enabled per CPU. So uh, interprocessor communication controller, uh, semaphores, AES, PKA, so K accelerator, random number generator, trust zone, a common flash interface, and sub gigahertz radio. So sub gigahertz radio can be, for example, assigned to Cortex M0 or Cortex M4. And in, uh, within the domain of CPU1, we have standard peripherals well known from the STM32L4 family. What you can see here also, the, the secure peripherals are marked in red. So you can see here the AS, uh, random number generator, PK, trust zone and uh, trust zone interrupt controller. We can partially secure some peripherals like flash memory, like SRAM, so we can isolate part of the flash, part of the SRAM as secure one. Some peripherals are security aware, like DMA channels. It is important to remember that radio system is autonomous. So we have dual core system and the flash and SRAM is shared between two cores. And for Cortex M0 as a secure engine, a secure core, we can enable the memory and peripheral isolations. Regarding HSC clock, the frequency is fixed. It is 32 megahertz. And this uh, oscillator supports also uh, TCXO, so temperature compensated oscillator. The main reason for that is the, is the support of ZigFox modulation, but I will provide more details later on. We have two cores, so to allow the debug process in an efficient way, so we have debug cross trigger unit. The back cross reader unit it is the it is the peripheral which allows to um, synchronize, uh, for example, the breakpoints between both cores. For example, we can stop the application on both cores in the same time. We have integrated uh, switching mode power supply uh, in order to increase the power supply efficiency to reduce the, the current consumption in run mode more details later on. And for SMPS, we have dedicated pins. As, and uh, as you can see, those pins are on diagonal of the radio pins. It is important in terms of reducing the noise impact of SMPS, to the, especially to the uh, radio receiver. And of course, this is the QFP, uh, the, the BGA uh, package uh, is also equipped with the same dedicated pins placed in the same safe way from EMC point of view.
more details about uh, transceiver. The transceiver covers quite wide band, uh, starting from 150 MHz up to 960 MHz. And what is important within this band, we can cover not only the, the ISM band 433 MHz and 868, 915, but also the wireless MBUS subband 169 MHz. For this band, the maximum allowed power is up to 500 milliwatts. And thanks to this, uh, the, the communication range can be quite significant for the FSK modulation. The basic functionality of the transceiver it is, of course, the support of the LoRa modulation from, let's say, several bits per second up to 17.4 kilobits per second. Support of GFSK modulation, so it is, for example, wireless MBUS or proprietary radio system. GMSK modulation, uh, this is the uh, subset of the FSK modulation, in fact. And it supports BPSK modulation, so binary phase shift keying. It is the modulation of ZigFox uplink. So the transceiver supports uh, ZigFox. You will see during the last part of this workshop the LoRaWAN and ZigFox demo. Uh, then oscillator, so we have external oscillator. It can be both crystal oscillator and TCXO and internal RF PLL frequency source. This RF PLL is the basic circuit to generate the base frequency for transceiver. Then the transceiver provides the ultra low power features, uh, for example, in standby, uh, it is about 110 nanoamps. The communication between the system and the transceiver is implemented through the SPI uh, interface. This SPI interface is, is internal one, no uh, externally exposed pins of, of that interface. There is a set of the radio interrupts to wake up the, the course. Radio can operate uh, as an autonomous system and thanks to this feature, can wake up the, the, the cores and maximum output power is up to 22 dBms and of course the external power amplifier uh, can be connected. And regarding the IP of the transceiver, it is Semtech core and it has been migrated from the combination of Semtech SX1261 and, and Semtech1262. So this is not direct uh, migration from uh, certain part number of the Semtech transceiver. It is a combination of 1261 and 1262. Considering that, I have practical hint for you because you can face questions regarding the crystals selections because the TCXO, it is not always the case because uh, due to costs. So uh, there is dedicated application node uh, on Semtech website, uh, the, the crystal selection guide. And uh, in order to select properly the crystal for uh, WL transceiver, uh, customers can and you can based on the uh, SX1261 crystals suggested by Semtech. So the typical RF bomb covers the balloon because input of the receiver is a symmetrical one. So we need to unbalance the signal. Then we have matching network both for the RX and the TX path. In fact, this is low pass or band pass filter. Then we have antenna switch. And this switch, it is important, is, is mandatory. The main reason for that is the radio performance the sensitivity of the transceiver. The last part, it, it is antenna matching circuit. If antenna impedance is different than 50, 50 ohms. Uh, antenna part, uh, so antenna, of course, it can be PCB antenna, it can be ceramic antenna, it can be dipole antenna, depends on the application. And uh, oscillator, as I, I mentioned, ZigFox TCXO is mandatory because ZigFox means extremely narrow band modulation. 
BPSK modulation and crystal, but following the recommendation of, of Semtech, it is an option for LoRa. For the crystal selection guide from Semtech, I mean AN1200.14. It was the bomb regarding the radio path. And if you would like to decrease the current consumption in RAM mode, the SNPS is the point, and for that we need extra coil. Important slide, so the finite state machine of uh, transceiver. So after um, startup, uh, after cold start, we are in sleep. And for sleep, the current consumption is about 50 nano amps. Then, if it is cold start, we need calibration. And then we are entering standby, and standby is 110 nano amps. As I, I remember well, the numbers are in data sheets. Always after standby, we need to enter FS stage. FS stage means frequency synthesis. And then, if frequency is the proper one, we can transmit. Then switch to the reception, or we can re receive, and then switch to the transmission and come back to the standby state. This FS stage is associated with particular timing, and this timing you can find in datasheet. It is between 300 and 400 microseconds. Of course, the calibration time is also defined, and the transition time between uh, TX and RX is also defined. This timing is, is important in terms of the current consumption, of course, for the low power applications. So the data buffer, we have 256 bytes of RAM reserved for the data buffer. We have two separated buffers, TX buffer and uh, RX buffer. And each buffer is associated with three parameters. So the base address, the buffer pointer, so the current uh, pointer to the to the buffer, and the payload length. Fortunately, thanks to the library, there is no need to care so much about the details because we have dedicated functions within the, the library, so we can just read or write to this buffer. Power supply. At first touch, the power supply looks quite complex. In fact, it is not so complicated. We need just to consider additional system. The radio system needs power supply, and we also need to consider the presence of the SMPS. So the main power supply domain it is the VDD. Then we have analog peripherals like comparators, ADC, DAC, EF buffer. We have power supply for the SNPS, and here, in fact, the VFB SNPS, this is uh, an output. This is the voltage generated by SNPS, or if it, it, if it is not active, it is the voltage generated by internal LDO. And this voltage is uh, fixed, it's 1.5 volts, 1.55, in fact. We have also the dedicated pin for the radio part, VDD-RF, and we have VBAT. So all the power supply domains except the radio are exactly the same like for the STM32L4 family. This slide uh, has been presented already during the marketing part. I would like to highlight a few points here. The, the first point is that the numbers are defined for the single core solution. So, in fact, we can see the numbers from Cortex uh, M4, STM32 L4 micro. The nice looking numbers, uh, I mean, 71 microamp per megahertz uh, and uh, 100 microamp per megahertz for RAM mode, are defined for the SMPS, and the numbers are defined when RF is off. The core mark score is 162, and please remember there is no floating point unique implementation on, on Cortex M4. The current consumption numbers given within the data sheet are relevant to core, so are core-wise 
for example, current consumption in stock mode. And the overall current consumption, it is the combination of the active core, so for example, Cortex M4, plus the current consumption of radio. So we have three independent subsystems. So when the, at least one core is active, uh, you can see in green the always clocked peripherals, sub gigahertz power RCC and uh, XTI, uh, SRAM memory, and also you can see the um, security uh, peripherals. So all the communication between the cores is possible thanks to the shared bus matrix. Both uh, CPUs can uh, enter the particular low power mode or power mode like CRAM, CSLEEP, CSTOP in an independent way. And this is very important. It is possible to allocate the particular peripheral to particular CPU by uh, using the, the dedicated bits in uh, RCC registers. And it is also possible to uh, allocate peripheral to both CPUs. Regarding uh, low power modes, each CPU can decide independently which uh, system low power modes can be used. Because of the STM32L4, we have uh, well known low power modes like stop zero, stop one, stop two, standby, or uh, shutdown. We can uh, wake up each CPU independently, so we can assign the wake up source to each of the CPU. This is important uh, because for dual core use case, if both CPUs want to enter the low power mode, the hardware mechanism which is present on the top of the, of the WL uh, executes kind of compatible requests and it selects the highest low power mode, which is compatible with the two view requirements. What means the highest low power mode? It selects the highest current consumption low power mode. So for example, if one CPU selects stop two and the second CPU selects standby, this mechanism allows to enter stop two mode. And uh, wake up is possible in independent way, so we can uh, wake up, let's say, CPU 1, uh, keeping the CPU 2 in low power mode. If we have two cores because of the security and both cores are in standby mode, during the wake up only the CPU 1 wakes up and the CPU 2 is uh, still in uh, reset mode in order to secure wake up. And the third system and low power mode behavior, so the sub gigahertz radio can also enter and exit uh, low power mode in autonomous uh, way. The radio can be woken up by the both by the CPUs or by the low power timer. The sub gigahertz radio is independent, so it doesn't impact the CPU low power modes and. Uh, we can imagine the configuration when both cores are in low power mode and only the radio is, is active, so this way we can uh, reduce the current consumption as much as possible and radio uh, interrupt can wake up the selected CPU. So it is possible uh, not only to wake up the system from uh, stop mode by transceiver, but also from the standby mode, which is relevant to the LoRaWAN because we can imagine the, the, the configuration and the node transmits data, I don't know, every, every one day. So for such a configuration, we can use standby mode. Of course, the context must be stored in RAM memory because for standby mode, the exit is through the reset procedure. And uh, just to remind you, for the standby mode, there is a possibility to preserve the, the further data retention. Uh, so the SRAM tool uh, has such a feature. SMPS, 
So uh, adding SNPS, the cost of the bomb is, is higher, but the power consumption efficiency is, is much better in round, round mode. So it make, makes sense for the systems where uh, run mode is quite often. And as you can see, for SMPS configuration, we have power supply of the SMPS. So this is VDD SMPS pin. And then we have output from the SMPS regulator. And this is VFB SMPS. And the output voltage is fixed. It is about 1.55 volts. And as you can see, it is both input and output. So uh, internally, the main regulator and the low power regulator is connected to this domain. And uh, externally, we can use this voltage VFB SNPS to supply the VDD RF 1.5 volt power supply domain. So RF LDO here. And for the LDO configuration, we don't have a coil, but the, the, the power consumption is in run mode is higher. And of course, the LDO configuration, this is practical hint, is much more relevant when we would like to really tune, really optimize the link budget because there is no noise generator uh, here. So the reset and clock control peripheral I think quite well known, uh, having in mind uh, STM32L4 family. The difference is the, that we have uh, HSC fixed frequency, um, so 32 MHz uh, crystal or TCXO. Uh, LSE, so this is standard clock for the um, RTC. LSI. Uh, the implementation of LSI is, is quite nice because now LSI is fixed uh, to 32 kHz and can act as a backup clock for the RTC. Of course, LSI is used for the uh, internal watchdog. Then we have MSI, HSI, uh, 16 MHz and PLL. The maximum frequency of the system is up to 48 MHz. And we have peripheral kernel clocks, so because we need to clock the peripherals. And well-known feature uh, from the L4 family, the clocks can be gated. The slide uh, you have seen, to highlight the feature, then we can allocate uh, the CPU-wise, the peripheral, we can allocate the, the peripheral to both CPUs. So here you can see in blue, you can see the peripheral allocated to the CPU 1, in orange to CPU 2, and in orange blue, the peripheral which is allocated to both uh, CPUs. We can deallocate peripherals, just get the clocks of the peripherals in order to reduce the current consumption in round and sleep mode. And if at least one of the CPU is active, the peripherals in green are, are always clocked. TCXO uh, interface, so the TCXO is connected to the uh, HSE oscillator, so the HSE pins, but uh, TCXO needs power supply and the power supply is provided for, for TCXO, it is so-called VDD TCXO, it's provided using PB0 pin and this pin is multiplexed internally, so the function uh, of this pin can be PBZ, PB0 or the function can be VDD TCXO, there is dedicated HSE bypass power bit in the uh, RCC register to control the feature. LSI, so internal oscillator, low, low speed oscillator, 32 kHz, as I mentioned. It can act as a backup clock uh, for the RTC, maybe as a main clock in order to reduce the, the bomb cost and current consumption as well, because LSI can be trimmed using timer 16 and HSE 
frequency as a time base. And so if we, let's imagine the HSE is a TCXO, so very good accuracy, for example, 2.5 ppm. So we can use LSI as a, as a main clock source for the RTC. Uh, of course, considering the periodic trimming. And the current consumption is very nice, so 110 nanoamps. And again, to highlight the radio operation is uh, autonomous, uh, so our radio can operate without CPU and uh, clocks for the radio systems uh, are automatically enabled because there is internal uh, 13 megahertz uh, clock and the activation of this clock is autonomous and automatic uh, following the expected power state of the radio. And that's all for the architecture.